currently, uh, and very often for hog killing or hog butchering, we would use a custom butcher cruises there in Concord, North Carolina. Right now, if you give them a call to get a date or an appointment to have a hog butcher, it is into 2022. Like they are over a year out. So we have many times killed our own hogs. You need the right weather. But because of that, and these hogs were already pushing almost 450 pounds, we butchered our own. Pretty much all of my life since uh, childhood, my family and uh, friends and neighbors have done this. And there's been uh, periods where we skip a year now and then, but uh, for whatever reason. But uh, the biggest reason for getting together and, and doing it as a group is the manpower. It's very labor intensive. And of course the hogs are hopefully pretty heavy by the time they're ready to, to butcher and uh, that way you've got extra hands on board and it makes the process go a lot quicker and it's a lot easier on everybody if you can uh, get a group together. Then it's also from times back a good way for everybody to socialize and work together and you know catch up on the news and whatnot and uh, there's a lot of camaraderie and uh, you know touching base with friends and the process and then keeping the art alive and the process too and learning the youngsters so they get their hands on and get to see you know so that's a big reason for having a group uh, together too as well as uh, saving labor and uh, making things go easier um, Shoot, shoot it and I was outside talking to that gentleman when they dispatched that one but those are my neighbors they already killed my two my two were named Thelma and Louise Aww. and I rubbed their bellies yesterday and although when it's time to dispatch them I can't be right there when it comes to the butchering I have no problem and how I come to terms with that is that they had the best life they were pasture raised they were never hungry, they were never cold, they had a barn to come sleep in, they had a creek to waller in in the summer. They had the best life for the seven or eight months they lived. But a hog can go from five pounds to almost, these were about 450 pounds, and what, um, I got them in March, and this is January. So, you know, nine months, that big. Also with our poultry houses, we have about 200 cracked eggs a day we're supposed to throw away, and we feed those to the hogs. They ate that mixed with whole corn and a little bit of hog pellets twice a day. They were never hungry. Plus they were on pasture, eating all the pasture they wanted. They'd eat hay with the cows. Yeah. Anyways, they had the best life. We'll go uh, to the pen where we have our hogs, and uh, we try and separate them, and uh, we'll dispatch them with a typically a 22 rifle. Generally, somebody that's been handling them is the one that takes care of it because they're used to that. And you wanna be extremely close if you can. There's no such thing as too close. You know, it's not a, a trophy match or anything involved like that at the time. Uh, you wanna be sure and get a quick dispatch and you need to do it uh, right above the eye line, about an inch above the eye line and typically the animal or your hog will fall right over. When you get the animal dispatched, we generally cut its throat so it'll bleed out. Yeah, it's kind of tough when you go to the barn with a rifle. It is, it, and it gets tougher as you get older. It really does. When I was a kid, it seemed like almost a, uh, you kind of desired for it, but now, you know, it's like 
well, you know, I want to eat, and I know I got to do it, but, you know, it's a little tough, but make sure you do a good job and go on and enjoy it. Hey, we thought, well, that is the biggest one, I think. Yeah, it's yeah. the biggest one. Two. Six. Well. <laughs> and then we'll cut its hind legs uh, where we can get the tendons exposed and get it on the gambrel and get it up so it can be draining, bleeding out. And then, of course, we come to the vat we start the scalding process. Typically, we try and have the, the water or the vat ready by about gathering time, so to speak. That way, you you're ready to go to work. And you want your water about 140, 145 uh, Fahrenheit. Back in the day, thermometers wasn't readily available, if at all. So uh, I don't know how the process came about. I guess it's trial and error. But uh, most of my ancestors would do the three, the three swipes. And that process is you go three times, and if the water's so warm that you don't want to go four, it's ready to put your hog in and start scalding. Jerry, that one piece of wood is too much. That would be no. No, we're good. We're good. I've been checking it. I thought it was, it was yeah, perfect. We're good. We're that, good. One, that one perfect. piece of wood was perfect. Yeah, we're good. If you can go more than three, you need a little more heat, get a little hotter. If you can go less than three, it's too hot. And that's a big no-no. If you put the hog in there and uh, you get him too hot, you'll set the hair and then you've got a disaster. You basically have to shave the hog then. And that's painstaking and pretty, pretty nasty and just, just not much fun. So avoid that and uh, make sure your water's right. One good thing about uh, these days, typically somebody's got a tractor or a skid steer as we did, and uh, that way you can get the, your hog out if the, the water is getting too warm or whatnot, and you can work a little while while it's cooling off. Uh, back in earlier days, uh, a lot of people would use chains and they'd have them under the hog and they'd pull the hog out onto a table or whatnot with those. <laughs> On the scraping, uh, you can scrape with a knife. Uh, it generally don't work quite as well as the, the bell-shaped things that we were using, and those are just called hog scrapers around here most of the time. And uh, you can find them at a lot of old farm auctions and whatnot. And uh, anyway, those work pretty well. A, uh, a hoe head without the handle does pretty good. And I have seen a square pointed shovel used and that works pretty well on the, the bigger areas. Once you get your uh, scraping underway and you get him scraped down good, uh, then you're ready to uh, gut the uh, hog. Of course, you need good sharp knives for the uh, gutting. Oh, okay. You let that boil and get over the limit, it ain't 
Okay. Good, buddy. Yep. Liver and this is lights. Lights is lungs. Oh. And somebody's taking that for their dogs. Got it. It's very spongy. And, uh, I don't know. Got it. Eating it. Got liver. It. This is my hog, so soon I'm going to be taking this stuff and um, putting it in the house and bagging it up. Gotcha. She can. Pick him up, Jeff. Send on What is that? Yeah. Oh, don't yeah. that. Yeah. We'll take generally and uh, we'll take an axe and split his pelvis bones and then cut down the right by the backbone, bust the ribs with the axe in as straight a line as you can and make sure you've got a good strong helper and a brave one to get on the back side of the hog and hold him open. And you generally use one man for that and the reason being you don't have two people involved to get cut or an accident to happen. If you just got one, you know, it's it's generally better. So you split the ribs, get him split all the way down, and then you can uh, can take the ribs out then with him hanging, or you can lay him down on a table. It just all depends on what works best for you. When you get him laid out on the table, or you could do this hanging also, but anyway, you, you'll take the, uh, there's leaf fat on the inside of the ribs, and the lower ribs, and you can take and pull that out. I'm good right at the moment. I'm just working on getting this old leaf lard out. I can't say he wants leaf lard. Well, let him have it. Let him shoot it. Let him have the leaf lard. I ain't sure you mean you want to mess with cooking out this one, no. We got enough cooking the livers. That's what I Making liver pudding in the south. We got and generally, if it's cooled a little bit, that'll be a little bit uh, better consistency to pull out. It'll be a little mushy and, and sticky if it's still warm. So you may have to wait a little bit, but it all depends on uh, the mood you're in and how well it's going. Get your leaf lard out, and then you can cut your ribs out. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little spain our credit one thing. He sharp my knife. Kenny. You got a bomb right here. He's sharp, big Eddie. Hey, Kenny. <laughs> Make he do nothing else, but he can sharp my knife. Sharp my knife. He can sharp my knife. There's never a dull knife needed at a hog killing. Uh, they're, they're worthless. So, anyway, good sharp knife. Cut your ribs out. Get them laid out. And then uh, you can start on uh, the rest of the animal. You can. Uh, Take your head off, which would generally we do that uh, even before we gut, but ever how you want to do it there. Uh, take the shoulders off, take your uh, tenderloins out, and uh, your hams off. When the ham is cut off of the hog, and if anybody wants to know what the ham is, that's that part of the hog, um, they take those hams and they will cover them with salt. And if you're gonna salt cure them, you may wanna trim them a little bit so the salt will lay on them a little better and uh, hang on them. Uh, of course, you need to do that in an area, uh, preferably, uh, where you can get a lot of salt on it, maybe a wooden box. You need to do that while the ham's still warm, if you possibly can. That ham has to be warm and fresh, and it'll take salt continuously and absorb it into the meat for about three days after I mean we leave salt on it a lot longer than that but about three days that ham is going to take probably 90% of the salt that it's going to take um, and old timers have a lot of kind of folklore around that if it's falling weather the hams won't take salt and they won't cure correctly falling weather is rain or snow or just a cloudy, you know, wet, damp day. It needs to be a bright, sunny, cold day. Generally, if it's getting into the 40s or 30s at night, and then, you know, 50s or so of a day, 
it's good enough. You need it not to be super freezing. If the meat freezes too fast, it's gonna quit taking salt. Uh, weather like today with the, the rain and the overcast skies is not a good time even if it is cold. The meat wants to draw moisture and it won't take salt so well. So as far as the salt curing goes, that's not good weather. If you get about three good days of the right weather, you typically got it made when you're salt curing then. It also coincided with a time of year when a lot of crops and stuff were already harvested and there wasn't a lot going on on the farm and people had more time to get the process took care of also. Once you get your loins out, you'll have your fat back and what's called your middling, which is a lot of people know as bacon these days, but it's called middling sometime back and still is somewhat around. But anyway, uh, your middling <clears throat> will be what's the belly and it'll have lean streaks in it as well as a good bit of fat. And you cut that off and that's your bacon, middling, side meat, whatever you want to call it. Then the upper part, which is generally pure fat, that's your fat back. Pretty much at that point, the animal's what we call blocked up. Some people call it quartered. Uh, when it's blocked up, you're ready for the uh, the grinding and uh, the, the cutting the bacon up, the fat back, whatnot, into uh, portions that you can handle in the refrigerator or wherever, however you're doing it. I don't know how I'm going to do this. We will cut this into small squares and then put them in freezer bags with this brown sugar, salt, pepper, red pepper. And then we put it in the bottom of the refrigerator and we turn it every day for about seven to ten days and then you have refrigerator bacon. What I do after that um, is put it in the freezer. Occasionally we've taken those slabs and smoked them. If you smoke them then you, they're cured and you don't have to put them in the freezer. But for ease it's just easy to put them in the freezer. When I get them out of the freezer is when I rinse all the brown sugar, salt, and spices off and I just slice it with my knife in slices like bacon. Oh, here's a good, see? So you can see the kind of yeah. what you consider bacon stri striations yeah. and stuff. So it's refrigerator bacon. Well, how here, long will that stay good? In the freezer? Mm -hmm. I like to have it eat within a year. And I'm sure that's not a problem. <laughs> no, it is not, but there is only two of us and this was a big hop. Okay, well, that's these true. are the ribs and I will block these into blocks that go into freezer bags, gallon freezer bags, and just freeze them. So because it's this thick and it has to fit in a gallon bag. Okay. And that is the skin and I'll leave the skin off. Now do you turn that into like this is actually crackling or anything? Like um, you can, you can, um, or was it, on some pork, what is it called? Pork skins. Yeah. Well, they, no, they, they, yeah. they cut them, they, they yeah. fry them and they poof up. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yes, yes. So, as you can see, that's sort of the bacon. So this is the mix of brown sugar, salt, black pepper, and red pepper. Some people will add a whole container of maple syrup and mix it in there and it gives you a little more maple flavor. Some people add liquid smoke. I hate liquid smoke. I like to get it coated. And then this goes in the gallon bag and we flip it over. This um, is probably about half salt, equal parts salt, brown sugar, and then pepper for me. It's just simplicity. This is about the size that I want when I put it in the refrigerator because I'll use this amount in about a week, maybe a little longer. So I can do a little bigger, but that's all that it is. It smells really good. We got a lot of good sausage and uh, I've been enjoying some tenderloin and we've got all kind of good fresh pork goodies that we've been uh, pigging out on. <laughs>
things have changed so much in my life uh, it's not even funny and uh, there's it's so hard for anybody to make a living it's virtually impossible for the small guy anymore and you know I've got an off-farm job or we couldn't make ends meet no way uh, this no way and uh, that's sad yeah farming's in trouble has been a long time in my opinion uh, Corporations are, you know, filling your shelves and refrigerators, and uh, you don't know what's in it. You don't know how it's been produced. When I was a kid, my folks took stuff to town, butter, milk, whatever they had that they didn't need themselves and sold it. And it was fine, and people wanted it. And, you know, now you can't do that. It's got to be inspected and labeled and processed. And Anyway, it's a different world. And uh, those times are gone, and the small farmers pretty much gone. And a lot of people doing it, I think, now are just kind of holdouts, somewhat like the Indians before they were stomped out. There was a few left here and there and whatnot, and uh, there's, uh, there's a not a lot left, and uh, they're getting gone fast. And stuff like this too, it's going with it and I don't know that it's going to come back.